Independent Chair of the Inquiry into the Sheffield Street Trees dispute. Thanks for joining us again. And again, I'm sorry we're a few minutes late, ten minutes late for um, this session because we were run over from the previous session and the technical problem we had at the beginning of that session. So apologies and I hope it's not inconvenienced you too much. Um, could you please tell us your name and your role or your, or your interest? Well, morning, Mark. My name's Paul Selby. Um, I, for a good chunk of the campaign, was chairperson of Save Nether Edge Trees, one of the local tree action groups which formed part of Stag Sheffield Tree Action Groups. And for a chunk of that time, I sat on Sheffield Tree Action Group's steering group. Very good. Thank you very much. And thanks for coming today. Um, as you know, we are live streaming this and recording it. Um, just want to make sure you understand that and happy with that. Very good. Um, I think, as you also know, um, this is um, part of my inquiry. And these uh, discussions, we need to make sure we conduct in a way which um, recognising there was lots of emotion and stress and difficult experience for many people, that we don't inadvertently um, say anything here which is blasphemous or libelous or, or brings into the public domain personal data about an individual that isn't in the public domain and shouldn't be in the public domain. If I get worried that we're getting a bit too close to the boundary for that, I will let you know. If in extreme circumstances we, we, we haven't resolved that problem, then I would have to curtail the hearing. Um, and you understand all that. Yes, great. Thanks. Perfect. So I sent you a list of topics I wanted to discuss with you, and in a minute we'll work our way through those. Um, but is there anything you would like to say by way of introductory remarks? Please, yes, I've got a prepared opening statement, if that's okay. Please. So I work in a relatively senior role in the Department of Work and Pensions, so I'm a national civil servant and therefore fellow public servant to those council officers working for Sheffield Council. Uh, I'm a qualified economist, qualified management consultant, an agile project manager. I work daily on subjects in relation to national legislation, contracts, uh, freedom of information requests. I therefore have expert insight into all the issues and topics that were and are at play in the Sheffield Street Street crisis. On top of this, my current day job, and has been for the last seven years, means I work daily with all 400 UK local authorities, so I know the postcode lottery of competence and behaviour there is amongst the local authority community. Prior to 2016, uh, whilst I had a poor view of Sheffield Council in terms of its inefficiency, I still had that basic view that at least they weren't evil, at least they didn't lie. That view has subsequently proved to be completely naive, sadly, as the evidence I've already submitted to the inquiry has demonstrated and which I'll talk about publicly here today. Remember, I'm a civil servant. Civil servants don't usually use such strong words, such as accusing other public servants of lying, but I am using those words here today, and I am doing so with a clear evidence base, um, which I've submitted to the inquiry. There is evidence of, of misconduct in public office, both by elected and unelected employees of Sheffield Council, Sadly, groups of individuals in the council can be proved, in my opinion, to have lied. Sadly, they did try to trash the reputations of citizens in the city, including myself, with false accusations. Sadly, I believe that some individuals really were like, acting malignly. Um, I'm also an individual who can see shades of grey. Unlike some of my fellow uh, street tree campaigners, I can see shades of grey, not black and white. It was never all trees need to be saved. Um, or you know, all that sort of thing. Some did need to be fouled. And because of that, um, and because of me demonstrating that reasonable behaviour to the council and Amy at multiple times during the campaign, they did often come to me and speak to me and have private conversations with me. Other campaigners didn't know about that. But by having those private conversations, I do have a unique insight that other people in the campaign don't have. Um, so I think that's quite crucial to know. Um, because of this evidence and in insight, I can categorically say that as a fellow public servant, if I was one of those individuals responsible in Sheffield Council for the decisions at the time, I would hang my head in shame. However, I'm afraid that I don't believe, even now, that there is full recognition from the key people who remain. I've listened carefully and full to the sessions from members of the council, elected and unelected, for the inquiry so far. 
and the, the two people who've come so far have both demonstrated a lack of understanding about what really happened and no understanding of the root causes. Both suggested in their interviews that uh, there wouldn't have been a problem had the council communicated better. I fundamentally disagree, as the evidence I present today will demonstrate it wasn't about poor communication from Sheffield Council. Better communication would not have prevented the issue from occurring. The root cause of all of this is the council signed a 25-year PFI contract with two key contract obligations that committed Amy to having perfectly straight curb lines and felling half of Sheffield street trees. The council believed then, and still believe now, that this is a good thing and this was a good thing. I'll demonstrate in this interview today, in reality, that not much has changed in terms of the attitude of the council to street trees and how, outside of street trees, the same attitude that the council knows best still pervades that something like the street tree crisis could happen again should a protest group dig its heels in as much as the street tree campaign did. Okay, thank you. Um, so, I'd like now to work my way through the list of topics that I've mm. um, flagged to you in advance, as I am with everybody mm. coming for these um, discussions with me. So, can we just start with, and you, you sort of alluded to it, but can, just tell me a little bit more about how you first became aware of the street tree removal replacement program, if you like, and what your concerns were initially. It's very interesting because I know there was things going on in sort of 2012, 13, 14. I was not aware of that because I was never, I never read local media, um, which is quite interesting because uh, I do quite avidly now, given what's happened. But my first, but there's a bit of a backstory here. A, I've got a keen interest in trees, but particularly elm trees. Elm trees were um, subject to a disease called Dutch elm disease in the 60s and 70s that wiped out nearly all elm trees in this country. So weirdly, in September 2014, I visited Brighton to see the cordon Sanis air zone where there's still lots of mature elm trees left. And then because I now knew what elm trees looked like, a month later I stumbled across in my own neighbourhood a 120 year old elm tree the now famous Chelsea Road Elm Tree. I didn't know that existed before. I probably walked past it tens of times not knowing it was there. Anyway, a year on from that, having discovered this tree, um, I noticed a, no a notification on it. This was December 2015. And it said the tree was going to be felled in two weeks' time. And I was like, crikey, what's going on here? Um, I must write to the council and say, oh, you, you misidentified the tree. Do you realise how rare this tree is? Um, please don't fell it, um, yeah, and all that sort of thing. Well, I didn't get a response back. And then, funnily enough, I bumped into one of the prominent street tree campaigners at the time, someone called Anne Barr. Uh, and Anne Barr was at Sharaville Market, and she said, oh, have you heard about the, all the trees that are going to fell in Sheffield? And I was like, no. Oh, and, but I, 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 is this really, fa this really rare tree that they're trying to, trying to fell, is that linked? Yes, it is. She said, why don't you join Save Never Edge Trees? So I joined, and then it all led on from there. I can talk loads more about what happened after that if you want, but that's how I first got involved. Okay, well, I, um, I'm sure we'll pick up mm -hmm. other, um, other things as we go mm -hmm. along, and you'll get a chance to say anything that you haven't had a chance to say mm -hmm. at the end as well, so we can pick up everything you want to say. Um, now, you alluded to this in your opening remarks, mm -hmm. but is there anything else you'd like to tell us about from what you know now, why you think the dispute um, arose? Yeah, and, it, and a lot of what I'm going to say now comes from freedom of information requests and answers to those. Um, but the, the two main things relate to the contract obligations. People talk, call them targets, and the council hate it being called targets because they're not actually targets. They're contract obligations. So in law, the, the Amy had to fulfil those contract obligations. So it's ha that actually makes them even worse than targets in some respects, but they're not targets. Those two contract obligations are one, and the key to this is, uh, there's lots of other contract obligations, but these two are key. One is the, the commitment to fell 17,500 trees over the full 25 years of the contract. Um, at, uh, people talk about how many trees there are in Sheffield. Uh, at the time the contract was signed, it was believed to, to be 30. 35,000 street trees, so that's why the 17,500 is half. Um, and the other thing being, the other key co contract obligation was for perfectly straight curb lines. 
that's not a legal requirement. Highways obligations, if you look at the Highways Act 1982, I think it is, it doesn't require perfectly straight curb lines. But the council inserted that into their contract because they believed that was the right thing to do. Both of those two things provided the incentives for Amy to do what they needed to do, which was fell 17,500 trees. The, 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 there was a few dis diseased and dying trees. The Elliot report 20, 2006 suggested there was about 1,000 to 1,250 trees that needed to be felled because of death or disease that the, the poor maintenance regime pre-contract had led to. Um, but then the straight curb line obligation, in my view, I've, I've got estimates later on when I give my evidence about how many trees that committed to felling, but that, that committed a whole load of trees to felling, probably about a third of, of the, the, the trees that were felled in that period of the first five years of the contract. And then on top of that, it was just random. A, we just needed to identify trees in that first five year period to, to get, get on track to felling 17,500 trees over 25 years. Okay. Um, again, you sort of started to touch on this, but is there anything else you want to say about your understanding of the contract requirements and the design of the mm -hmm. programme and the incentives and constraints which, which that created um, when it came to the street trees? There was a lot of things in the contract. I have to say, even now, I have not read word for word every single bit of the contract. I've skim read everything I possibly can for reference for street trees. And so um, those are the things that were in the contract that were key. In the contract, there are ob were obligations on Amy to have various things like method statements and other things. And there are other documents that Amy were pr uh, required to produce, which um, I'm not sure of the legal status of them, but they were clear documents produced. One of which, for example, was a document that committed them to felling big canopy trees and replacing them with smaller trees that would never get as big. And in the, con in, in the talks between the campaign and the council in September, October, November 2018, the council revealed for the first time that publicly, verbally, it, that, that that was the case, that they wanted the maintenance costs when they re-inherited ownership back in, in 2037, after the contract's finished, 25 years, they re-inherited re less maintenance costs at that point of the street trees than when they went in. And that is why they wanted Amy to write this document, I think this was one of the strategy documents, which committed them to replacing the big trees with the small trees. You know, some campaigners talk about them being lollipop trees, the trees that were, they were replaced with. They're not. They're, they're just trees that of a different species that will never get as high, never have as big a canopy, and therefore never have as many environmental benefits. Okay. Now, you told us a bit about your interest in the elm species and mm -hmm. the, the, the Chelsea elm, as people call it. What more would you like to tell us about um, the case of that tree on Chelsea Road, your involvement, how the discussion of that tree was received by the council, and, and what the eventual resolution or the current position is? It's a long story, so let me begin at the start. So I told you about meeting Anne Barr, joining Seven Save Nether Edge Trees. Um, there was still a belief at that point that surely, even if they were going to fell some of the other trees, that this famous tree wouldn't get felled. You know, it's, it's a rare tree. In terms of equivalency, I, the, the example I always use, it's not equivalent, but it's close. In Africa, there are more black rhinos than there are old elm trees in the UK outside of the cordon sanitaire zones in Edinburgh and Brighton. Less than 1,000, it is estimated. Therefore, that Chelsea Road elm tree is incredibly rare. It's, it gets Dutch elm disease every year and fights it off. It's that special. It's got host of white letter hair street butterfly, which has declined massively since the 1970s when the elm tree, um, elm trees in the UK declined its, its only host species. Um, this tree is special. So I thought, right into the council, maybe getting a petition together, uh, maybe re re representations of my local councillors, that sort of stuff, would get things done. Well, the council ignored me. Councillor Terry Fox, which is who I wrote to at the time, he was head of the street tree, sorry, the, the um, street tree issue and the contract, he didn't answer me. And subsequent FOI questions revealed that he had asked his officers to make me go away. Interesting. Um, 
it, eventually, I got so frustrated by the lack of response, the lack of communication with me, that I reached out to Becky State, who's the chief executive of the Wooden Trust at the time. I saw her on BBC News talking about the Sheffield trajectory issue, and I thought, I'm just going to reach out to her on LinkedIn. So I did, and she responded instantly and said, I'm going to put you in touch with some of my team. And we talked about an idea I had to create publicity, and that was to park an open-top bus under the Chelsea Road arm at the time that the White Letter History Butterfly was flying in the canopy, so that young children, adults, whoever, could stand on the open-top bus and see the White Letter History close by. It virtually never comes down to the ground in the UK. It does occasionally, but it's really hard to see them. But in the canopy, you can get to see them close that was the idea of the, white, of the open top bus event. And in July 2016, the bus was parked under the tree, created a massive publicity event. It, it was the beginning of making the, the Chelsea Road elm tree probably the second or third most famous elm tree in the country. Uh, and that, that led to interesting conversations with elm experts in the country. It led to the Woodland Trust uh, nominating with my uh, help the tree to be tree of the year in 2016 in their annual competition. It came second for England as a result. In effect, we make, made the tree sort of unfellable because it had this reputation nationwide. This is an incredibly rare tree. But the council still wanted to fell it. They, they, they tried to spin stories in, in the media to say, oh, it's going to cost, at different times they gave different quotes, £40,000, £50,000, £60,000, £70,000 to save the tree. But they commissioned an independent arborist report. Even outside of Amy, they, com they commissioned it completely independent to say, how can this tree be saved? The report, in effect, said, yes, it can. It's got one key decaying branch low down that needs to be removed. Other than that, the tree is fine. The council then put a press release out saying the tree was seriously dangerous and needs to be felled. The report didn't say that. I'd got, they'd even given me the report. I'd have had, it had it couldn't believe what they were saying in, in the public domain because we've got an independent highways engineer also to refute those quotes. The independent highways engineer said it was going to cost about one and a half to three and a half thousand pounds in terms of engineering solutions around it to save the tree. All council did, they tried to discredit me in public. They, try, they said, tried to say there wasn't a white letter hair streak in the tree. So the, the Wildlife Trust found eggs on the tree and said, yeah, the, wild, the, the butterfly exists. They did everything they can. Even despite that, despite all the pressure we put on, in July 2017, Paul Billings from the council called me up while I was on my holidays, it happened to say, we're still going to come to fell the tree. And so we did everything we can in the background then to prevent that tree from being felled. The, um, uh, they, they said you know, they were going to prepare to do it in early 2018. People from the campaign came and blocked the tree from um, being felled. But what the council were going to do at that point was pretend to prune the tree and then get to fell it. So that, funnily enough, they didn't put safety zones around the tree, so the injunction didn't apply. Camp campaigners got in the way. They, in fact, set a trap because the council wanted it, us it, to look like the campaign were preventing pruning for safety reasons. That wasn't the case. But because of that incident, Liz Ballard from the Wildlife Trust, Trust got involved and arranged a secret meeting between her, me, and Darren Book from Amy, where we agreed informally of a way to protect the tree from being felled. Basically, Darren Book said he, he couldn't ever commit his people to felling the tree, and um, therefore what he was going to do was put it on an inspect, in, enhanced inspection regime. Um, so therefore, the, count, the, the tree would still be listed for felling officially, but it wouldn't be. They'd, they'd, they'd wait for the enhanced inspection regime. Again, I think that Darren thought that the, the tree would catch Dutch elm disease and therefore the enhanced inspection regime would not be sufficient to fell the tree. But I knew that that was fine, so I was happy to sign up to that agreement. Funnily enough, the campaigners didn't want me making compromises. Other campaigners didn't want me making com compromises with the, with the, with the AME. Um, I got severe abuse from other campaigners for the following two weeks prior to the pruning, the tiny bit of pruning actually being done. That was part of the agreement. Uh, Paul Billington was furious that Darren Buck, myself and Liz Ballard had, had brokered uh, an agreement to keep the tree up, but he could do nothing about it because Amy were in effect accepting liability for, for the enhanced 
Monsoon regime, it created quite a fuss, but actually, if we look back, this was the first time, literally at any time during the whole campaign, where some sort of brokered agreement had happened and we'd saved a tree. Okay. The tree is still standing, by the, by the way, today. A very simple engineering solution was put in place. Uh, very Literally, in the last two weeks, um, the road was resurfaced um, and the pruning, t- a tiny bit of pruning happened, and the white letter streak is still flying in the canopy each June and July, which is great. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I want to ask you now about the published five-year tree strategy document about which I know you have some concerns and some things you want to um, tell us about. Um, So please talk to me about that issue. Yeah, I need to be very careful what I say here, so I'm going to read a little bit from from, from my notes. So Rebecca Hammonds has already given a good account of this quite shocking, in my view, uh, misconduct in public office. Um, I don't know specifically which individuals in the council were involved in, in my view, fabrication of what in my view fake version 7 document but in my view it was fabricated I once had a conversation with one of the leading council officers about this topic and they told me explicitly that they did not understand what their predecessors had done in relation to the document because this senior individual in the council hadn't been around when this document was fabricated, they were in a different part of the council and when they came in um, they were shocked what they found (laughs) with this document. So privately, this council officer told me that they were shocked at what the predecessors had done. Um, To fake a document, in my view, is shocking in itself. To then use it in two key court cases as evidence of the council's reasonableness, in my view, uh, I would allege potential perjury, which is quite interesting. What Rebecca didn't go into detail about in in her account was what the document actually contained. This fake document includes what they, the document says are 14 free costed engineering solutions that, a, that Amy could theoretically use to retain trees. However, in various subsequent FOI requests made by myself and others and which I've submitted to this inquiry, evidence proved that that not to be true. Many of these uh, free costed engineering solutions couldn't actually be used legally for various reasons. Um, Eight, I think I said that in in my evidence submitted that eight of the 14 were ruled out. Some were illegal, some were bad practice, some were ruled out in other parts of the contract. Very interesting. But this is what this document version 7 contained and which is what was used in court as evidence of the council's reasons. I also submitted um, an FOI request where the council admit, and I've submitted this to the inquiry, where the council admit to version 7 only being a strategy document, with it being superseded by the PFI contract obligations. In other words, and I know this through my own job, (coughs) strategy documents are just strategy. They're not an operational uh, obligation. They're not anything else. My my strategy colleagues in DDP write strategy documents for breakfast, put them on a shelf, and often they're never used again, they're never referred to again. Obviously the council did intend to use this document, it was written just before the first court case, and was used in the first court case, and was then used in the injunction case as well. Um, So it was a a document they intended to use, but it didn't didn't actually do what it purported to do. Um, So just to to summarise what what I've said in this thing, um, even though there were two key PFI contract obligations, the perfect straight curb lines and, the, and to fell 17,500 trees. That wasn't in that strategy document. I wonder why. Did one reveal that to the court, did they? But they did reveal false information to the court in this document. Um, so let me be clear here, just to summarise, this is evidence, in my view, of misleading the court at best, perjury at worst. Okay. Um, Let me move on now to anything else you'd like to tell us about your role in the various groups. You played a chair role in one group, you were on the steering group Mm. for other groups. Um, What would you like to tell us about that? How campaigners, protesters chose different courses of action, how people work together and separately. Um, What would you like to tell us? So I talked a little bit about the elm tree 
I was solely focused on the elm tree from the period when I first became involved in the campaign in December 2015, pretty much through to October 2016. Uh, I didn't focus on anything else. At around that time, autumn 2016, suddenly it became real to me. They planted a whole load of other not ITP, independent tree mm -hmm. panel notifications on trees in my area, about 200 and something trees in my local area, which they were going to try and fell. It was around 16% of all the street trees in my area, and including on my own road. Montgomery Road is famous for its straight avenue of 96 uh, lime trees, and they were proposing to fell 20 of those, including 11 right close to my house. The avenue was going to have one half completely felled, so it wouldn't have been an avenue anymore, it would just been a line of trees. Shocking change to the character the neighbourhood. I realised I had to get more involved. The, the other campaigners were not having any real success, and I thought I could bring my civil service skills to the campaign. So I didn't volunteer to be chair of uh, Save Nether Edge Trees at that point, but it was clear that other campaigners couldn't really organise a coherent meeting. People talked over each other, people didn't fulfil action points, all that sort of really basic stuff, but really key stuff. So I offered to chair the, the meetings, if not chair the group, because I didn't have time to do day-to-day day -day stuff like going out on the streets because of my day job in the civil service, but I could chair meetings in the evenings. And I sort of I got the group organised, I stopped people talking over each other, I got people to fulfil action points, and Save Nether Edge Trees became really successful. As a result, we, we increased our membership from, I think it was about 100 members, to about 400 at our peak. Um, we were the most proactive group in terms of formally seeking garden permissions. We knocked on people's doors, got, got people to give us the permission to stand in the garden to protect trees outside the house. We did a whole load of fundraising. We probably raised the most money for STAG and all their legal campaigns. I'm really proud of that little group of about 20 core, core group members in Saving Other Edge Trees, some of whom will never want to be identified, but they did an amazing job. Um, we were definitely the most successful local group. One of the interesting things was, um, if you were chair of one of the local groups, you, be, you be had an automatic membership of STAG steering group. Um, Helen McElroy, uh, who was chair of say, Seven of Those Trees up until autumn 2017, couldn't cope with working with STAG anymore because it was so dysfunctional, STAG steering group at the time. Um, there, was, there was lots of vitriolic uh, anger between different campaigners. So she stepped down and said, Paul, please, 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 can you go to these meetings instead? You might be able to organise them a bit better. I was really shocked with what I found in autumn 2017, just how demoralised, disorganised Stag Steering Group was, and that was part of what the reputation of Stag Steering Group was on the streets. Campaigners who blocked felling really didn't have a good opinion of Stag Steering Group, and I understood why. Um, and um, it took a while, it took other people, it took Paul Brook coming along and becoming chair of Stag, um, but the Stag got better ship shape, and that helped, um, I think, particularly once the pause had happened, um, Stag became <coughs> a bit more organised. There was still a lot of uh, infighting amongst Stag Steering Group members, and that was horrible. I hated being part of Stag Steering Group. It was my least part, favourite part of the campaign, but at least Stag Steering Group started to do useful stuff, and um, you know that led to various really good things during late 2017, 2018 and onwards. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I want to ask you next about the Forestry Commission investigation, um, including the origins of that investigation and any other discussions mm. you want to tell me about that, but also the findings and your view on the findings. Mm. So it all begins in autumn 2017. Michael Gove visited Sheffield thanks to the Yorkshire Post informing him about what was going on and called the situation bonkers. Now there was a real opportunity there for the campaign to make use of Michael Gove and his special advisors. He offered to stag that actually you know, my, my special advisors are at your beck and call, we'll do everything we can to help in, in, in the, your campaign. Because he genuinely cared about street trees across the country as in his role as uh, Secretary of State for DEFRA. Stag didn't take that opportunity, which was really odd. 
So via Alison Teal, Alison gave me the, uh, the, the contact details of Michael Gove Special Advisors, and I went to them with a suggestion around imposing a, nas- a, a TPO, mm-hmm. a Tree Preservation Order, by the Secretary of State uh, for, uh, what, what was it called then? Community and Local Government, DCLG. He could, in legislation, even though it had never been used, even though people didn't know it existed, in legislation it showed that nationally, Secretary of State the DCLG could impose from above a TPO without the local council uh, having anything to do with it. Now normally, it's done by the local council, and it, in history it's never been imposed nationally, but via the Michael Grove Special Advisors, we came up with a plan for Sajid Javid at the time to, to do that. Now Michael Gove was pressing really hard for Sajid Javid to do that. Mike, if it, Michael Gove had been Secretary of State for DCLG, he would have done it. But I think Sajid Javid was very aware of the localism agenda and the precedence it might set by central government intervening in what is perceived to be a local matter. Even though the legislation allowed it, he was very cautious and so it didn't happen. But the relationship was forged in that regard. And I kept in contact with the special advisors all the way through autumn, winter, uh, into early 2018. And then my FOI request, which was submitted in January 2017, had been through internal review, gone to the Information Commissioner, eventually the Information Commissioner forced under legal threat the council to reveal the the contract obligations around 17,500 trees. That got everybody really interested in like including the special advisor about what, what the hell can we do? And I put to them a legal case which I'd been thinking about through January and early February, which is around the Forestry Act 1967. Now the Forestry Act 1967 forces anyone who wants to fell over and above a certain volume of trees to apply for a licence from the Forestry Commission. Very old act. It was a really interesting piece of legislation. And that, super, you know, that, that actually supersedes some of the obligations in the Highways Act. Now, a fellow campaigner a year earlier had submitted that to the Forestry Commission as the Forestry Commission could intervene, but that campaigner's got some behavioural issues and he basically used a foul, foul-mouthed tirade to the Forestry Commission in his email suggesting they commit um, legal proceedings and um, sadly, as you can imagine, the Forestry Commission chose to ignore a foul-mouthed tirade in an email. So I picked this up and said to Michael Gove Special Advisors, I still think there's a, there's a legal case here. Here's my evidence. They thought this was great. They put it to Michael Gove. Michael Gove ordered the Forestry Commission to start a criminal investigation into Sheffield Council potential alleged illegal felling of too many street trees, too, too much of a volume of trees without applying for a licence. They can, said, it's got Can I just ask yeah. you, do you have correspondence in relation to this series of events? Yes. Would you be willing to give it yeah. to the inquiry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, let me just write that down. Um, evidence. So you, what you're looking for here is the evidence of the interaction between myself and Michael Gove Special Advisors. Yes, yeah, so yeah. or anything related to, to this and how the Forestry Commission came to be drawn in? There's a lot of emails. Okay, well I'm happy to read anything you're willing to send me. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll send them, but it's going to take a while. Okay. <laughs> Cool. So, so yes, it was, it was then in very, er, I, think, I think it was very early April 2018, uh, the Forestry Commission sent a letter to the Sheffield Council saying, we are beginning a, a criminal investigation into your alleged illegal felling without a licence. Please do not start again felling trees, street, street trees in Sheffield, because if you do, we'll treat this as an aggravated crime if we eventually find it to be a crime. And interestingly, over, it, was over, it took a hell of a long time. I think it took a year and a quarter for the, the Forestry Commission to do their eventual report. There was a lot of interaction between myself and the Forestry Commission. The Forestry Commission didn't want to investigate. They really didn't. They hadn't got the resources to investigate because they'd been uh, cut through austerity cuts. They were really cautious about using a 1967 Act never intended for street trees because it's all around um, uh, post-war uh, 
capacity to have wood in this country, so that's how the Forestry Act is written, and it's just got this clause about you need a license to fell such a volume of trees. So they didn't want to use law written in 1996-7 for something it was never intended to do. That being said, it still did apply. It was live law in this country. They were very cautious. At one point in summer 2018, they were, they were ready to, to rule that there was no case to answer. So I sent them a whole load of evidence that says, are you sure? Are you sure you really want to stop the investigation? Here's a whole load more evidence which proves it was, it was definitely illegal. And they took a step back and they thought, oh God, we're going to have to really seriously investigate this because there's a potential that we, we're found not to have investigated this thoroughly enough. So they kept on investigating and they kept on investigating. And then they called me to give me an update in around January 2019 and said, yeah, but you know, our, our legal advice is that we haven't got a case to, to make, even though we probably believe the council did break the law. We don't want to, we don't want to rule in this way because you know, it, it, it's, it's risky for us to, to say that. So I worked then with the Woodland Trust who funded one of the top environmental barristers in this country to, in effect, write a barrister's opinion on my legal case. And we sent that to the Forest Commission. And that delayed them again for another six months from producing the report. But it did sway their report. Um, as it's written, it's very carefully written, you can see that you know, they, they absolutely do not accuse, or, or they do not, do not find the council broke the law. It doesn't say that. But what it does say is everything they can possibly say around the edges of that, which is, you might have broken the law, but we haven't got insufficient evidence, um, and we you know, encourage you to do X, Y, Z, here's some recommendations, all that sort of stuff. It was everything they could possibly do without actually accusing the council of having, having, having broken the law. And that's what the report says. And, it was, and it, in effect, it sent, sent a chill through um, the, uh, the council. It is worth saying, just one bit I want to get in in here, Further freedom of information requests that we put in, it wasn't me this, somebody else put in, uh, revealed that in Mar late March and April there was conversations in the council which was about the pause, which was only ever meant to be temporary. The council fully intended to come back to fell the remaining 309 trees. What they intended to do was ring bark the trees in the middle of the night uh, and that would have killed the trees completely when the, camp the campaigners wouldn't have been able to do anything about it. So they would have been standing ring bark, the trees don't recover from ring barking, they would have died, so the trees would have had to have been felled, and the council intended to come back and do that, the pause was only meant to be temporary. Thankfully the Forestry Commission intervened with their letter about this ag potential aggravated crime, and that turned the, the temporary pause into a very, very long pause that last, well, it lasted the whole duration of the um, criminal investigation, but in the meantime Brian Lodge was removed, Councillor Dagnall came in, shift of approach, things had moved on. So thankfully the Forestry Commission investigation came at the crucial time because the council would have come back and felled those trees. Okay. Now in relation to something you've just said mm -hmm. um, about the ring barking issue, mm. uh, again, is there any documentation yeah. you have on that? Yeah, yeah. Um, and if there is, I'd be very interested to like said, see it. It's not, it's not mine. Uh, FOI, so I'd, I'm going to have to get it from somebody else, but yes, it's there. Okay, well I'd be very interested in anything that you or anyone else mm -hmm. would like to mm -hmm. send me on. Um, now, I wanted to ask what in your view, and you've touched on some relevant things, were the key, or some things that may you may say were relevant, mm -hmm. but what in your view were the key factors which led to the uh, council to pause mm. tree replacement removal operations in March 2018? Wow, there's a whole load of factors that came together um, so firstly was the contract obligations were revealed uh, through my freedom of information request which funny enough, I never expected to find this, I was, I was actually looking for something to do with how quick Amy had to respond to re requests, I, I didn't expect it to reveal <laughs> these contract obligations, so even I was shocked. Uh, but anyway, once that got into the media, it, there was a media storm, na not just locally, nationally, internationally. I, I, was, I happened to be in London with work, um, and I got a call to, you know, can, can you do an urgent media interview? And I stood on that famous BBC Westminster uh, 
scorched when you look out over the Palace of Westminster because I, that was the only time I could do an interview. Literally, my phone was red hot that day because the media wanted to talk to me. And the council was suffering exactly the same thing. I know that what they must have been suffering from the national and international and local attention. It was a media storm and they couldn't make it go away. You had this bizarre situation of Councillor Lodge doing interviews saying, it's not a target. Well, yeah, technically he was right. It wasn't a target, but it was a contract obligation, which was worse. Um, and they talked about it being a mobile phone insurance contract, which it clearly wasn't. So they, they looked like fools trying to defend that in the media and they couldn't make it go away. So that was one thing, the media storm. In the weeks preceding the, this, Darren Butt had been having private words with me. We we'd struck up a bit of a relationship because of the Chelsea Road Elm Tree. And he told me privately that he was doing his absolutely very best to persuade the council to, to allow them to stop felling trees. But the council were rigidly telling him, you, you've, got, you've got to keep on going, you've got to keep on going, you know, you've got this obligation, you must fell these trees. Amy didn't want to do this. They'd, I don't know how long they would not wanted to do it, but certainly in February 2018 they didn't want to continue, and it was probably earlier than that. Um, so Darren Bolt was doing a lot of work to try and persuade the council to let Amy not fell trees anymore. It was probably something to do with the costs of all that security they were having to pay for and all this sort of thing. Then there was the Maysbrook Park Road incident, which has been described in other sessions, so I won't go into detail, but the council described it as a riot. It wasn't a riot, but it was, it was the most tense of all the battles on the streets that had ever been. All those things came together to cause a pause, but the pause was all there to, uh, so that the council could regroup, work with the police on the new strategy, potentially do this ring barking, it was only meant to be temporary. Then there was the ring barking plan. Then there was the Forestry Commission letter. And then I think the council just, you know, with the Forestry Commission letter, I think they realised they just couldn't, they had to diff do a different approach. Literally all these things where they just couldn't get their view out there. Obviously I believe it was a wrong view, but no one was listening to them anymore in the media, whereas previously the media had sort of trusted the council, because surely councils tell the truth, don't they? Well, well, then the contract obligation was revealed. They realised the council had, hadn't told the truth in the past. So that was interesting. So they, they put, removed Councillor Lodge and they brought in Councillor Dagnall. Now, interestingly, there's a little bit of a, a, a side issue here. One of the council officers once told me that Councillor Lodge would do ev anything they told Councillor Lodge to do. I genuinely believe Councillor Lodge didn't realise some of the things he was doing. In August 2017, he said something on the council steps about the financial penalties as a result of not felling trees. He, I think, genuinely believed that he was telling the truth then because that's what he'd been briefed by his people. Because the officers told me that Council Lodge would do everything they told him to do. When Councillor Dagnall came in, Councillor Dagnall didn't believe his officers. He asked a lot of more difficult questions of his officers, and his council officers didn't like that because he genuinely wanted to do a different approach. He wanted to see what he could do with the campaign. I don't think that Council Dagnall believed he could solve everything. I think he still believed that some trees needed to be felled, but he, he believed that actually some sort of, let, let's get some different views, let's, let's see what we can do. We might be able to save some of these trees and you know some sort of brokered compromise where a quarter of the trees get saved and the rest get felled and everyone's going to be happy. The council, the council could be demonstrably shown to have been listening. I think that was Councillor Dagmar's view, but at least he would began to listen. And then there's a lot that went on from there, if you want me to go into stuff about the mediated talks. Yes, yeah, so I wanted to come on to that. Um, so, so maybe, mm. unless there's anything else, you, I mean, you've given me a list of reasons mm. why, in your opinion, the, there was a pause and a mm. change of approach, and that led into the decision to seek mediation. Mm. and. My understanding is you played a role in some of those discussions. I wanted to ask you um, about that, really. How, how um, the process was initiated, as far as you know, and what the campaigner's key objectives were, really, in the mediation talks. I, I don't know what conversations were had within the council, but I, I'm pretty sure it was Councillor Dagnall said that we needed to, to say, right, we some sort of mediation talks. I remember there were some conversations between Stag and the council during summer 2018 
where they sort of put an approach out and said, well, we're considering mediating talks. Would, who would you consider was a fair mediator? They, they, allow, they, they picked and employed uh, a trained facilitator, and they also brought in the Bishop of Sheffield as a, as a local, to sort of some sort of neutral, but local perspective. And, and Stag were very suspicious about this because they, I think, you know, we all thought, what is this going to? We walk into a trap here, where they, they, we we have some talks. The talks break down, and the, and the, the council then say, ah, you know, we tried, but they were really rude, uh, and they wouldn't listen. The campaigns wouldn't listen, and therefore we're going to continue because the talks don't work. That's what we sort of feared. It didn't work out that way. I uh, don't, you know, the, the talks went on. They weren't perfect by any means. You never expect to get per- perfection. You know, we went in with three key things. Mm-hmm. The campaign went with the key three things. We wanted to deal with the past, the past, the present, and the future. Right. So we wanted an inquiry to deal with the past. We wanted to have um, some sort of review of the 309 trees that remain felling to see how many could be saved. And we wanted that done independently. So that would deal with the present. I wanted a street tree strategy that would be exemplary and that would hopefully protect the remaining 25 years of the, well, sorry, the remaining 20 years of the 25 year contract to, to protect the potentially 11,500 other trees that would have been felled to hit that obligation, mm. uh, the, the contract mm. obligation. We never expected to get everything because you don't in these sorts of talks, but we expected a bit more. I think um, Christine talked about how the council didn't share stuff with us prior to the first meeting, even though they were obligated to do so, which if they'd have been asked to do so by the mediator, they didn't. You're referring now to what Christine King told me yes. last week. Yeah. yeah. And so they just presented as a fait accompli again. Oh, we've been able to magic up 25 trees or something that we can save, but we're going to still fell the others. And you should be really happy because we're going to fell them in a phased approach. Not everyone this year, a few next year, a few the year after that, and a few more up to five years. But we're still going to fell everything apart from these few trees that we've been able to save. And we were like, are we allowed to talk about this? And they're like, no, no. So that was their going into the, into the talks, which was very interesting. And you could see the raised eyebrows from um, the mediator and from the Bishop of Sheffield. They were too professional to say anything, but they were interesting approach. Um, but I think the council thought that that would be sufficient for them to demonstrate. The talks went on. Then there was the announcement of a joint agreement in December uh, 2018. I have to say Paul Brook did an amazing job there. He, he got words into the joint agreement that... This is what some people call the declaration. Yes, the joint declaration, I should say. So joint declaration rather than joint agreement. It, it, was, it was very well worded. Paul Brook worked really hard at getting it worded to pretty much confirm that all the 309 trees would be jointly investigated. We could observe, we could see what trees could be saved. Um, it didn't commit to an inquiry. We, we probably never imagined there would be an inquiry because of what we knew had gone on, the lies and the misleading and the various other things. And um, We didn't think an inquiry would go on because uh, that would reveal potential misconduct in public office. Um, but they did commit to potentially doing a future street tree strategy. And the reason why I think they did commit to that was because strategies, like I said earlier in the interview, can be put on a shelf never to be looked at again. They hoped that they'd write an example of a street tree strategy and then they wouldn't be held to account for the delivery of it. Um, that was their thought process in, at the time in December 2018. So they committed to probably doing uh, and considering a, a, a writing a joint street tree strategy together. But we were quite happy with the outcome of the, the talks and the negotiations because we believe we could demonstrate in the joint investigations that many of these trees could be saved and learn some lessons from it as well to apply to the future. And we also believe that uh, writing a strategy would then be able to hold them to account for it. And that's all we've got. Okay. So you talked about the declaration, mm. which was the next thing I was going to ask you a bit more about. But mm. um, what is there anything else you want to say about what remained to be resolved after the publication of the declaration? Loads. Loads of stuff. Obviously, we need to then work together to write the strategy. We then need to work together to deliver the strategy. We need to work together to do the joint investigations. 
learn the lessons from the investigations, formally declare many of these trees to be saved after the joint investigations, and we still need to persist in trying to get an inquiry because the, the, the findings from the inquiry are, are highly relevant to wider, much wider than the street trees. It's, it's the whole governance of the council. So we knew there were still loads to be done post December 2018. Okay, so let's talk about a couple of those things. Um, what more can you tell me about the programme of the joint tree inspections and the subsequent tree, walk, uh, tree works during 2018 and 2019? So the joint investigations began in January 2019. And I remember it well. I was funny if I was in, on holiday in Lanzarote and other stag members were, were recording, here's the joint investigations going on, and I could wa- almost live stream from my sunbed what was going on in the first investigated trees. And it was hilarious because these were trees where the council stated they were felling as a last resort, they couldn't, they couldn't be saved. Amy went up, dug up some tarmac and said, oh, guess what? This lump in the tarmac, it's six layers of tarmac that have been laid on top of each other over the last 30 years. We just removed the layers of tarmac. The roots are really low down. We just resurfaced. This tree could be saved. So it was like a half hour job. And that went on. And it went on. Don't get me wrong, there were in, in those investigations there were some more slightly more complex that were longer than half hour jobs. There were some that took half a day. I think there was one that took a full day. But every tree could be saved. And Interestingly, I don't, I don't know what point they reached, I think it was about a third or a half that the 309 had been investigated by autumn 2019, and there was a lessons learned review done at that point that was written, and it was again another joint statement from the council, Amy and Stag. Again, Paul Brook did an amazing job of ensuring key words were in that, which actually implicated the council and Amy, you know, where you know, they admitted that last resorts hadn't been found previously and now last resorts have been found to save the tree. Um, in, in that joint lessons learned uh, meeting, so it, sadly it's not on public record, but Darren Butt admitted that when they've been doing their original uh, look at the trees uh, in sort of the 2013-2014 period to say which trees need to be felled or not, they knew in their heads that there was the dead trees, obvious, that needed to be uh, you know, felled, there was the trees to, to the strict straight curb lines that, you know, that they could use that excuse to fell the trees. And then they had another set of trees that they needed to make up in that first five years to get on the road to fell in 17 and a half by 25 years. I think, I've never had this proved, that the target at that point was 6,000 trees in the first five years. It was an internal Amy target, I think, not a Sheffield Council target, but I've never had that proved. But Darren Butt admitted, he didn't say the number, but that his Amy people were going out just literally picking trees at random to make up the 6,000 number, or, or the number that was un- unrevealed, um, to make up a number. That's interesting, that came out verbally in those conversations in, in autumn 2019. Um, I think there's some wording in the document that alludes to it, but it doesn't say it explicitly. In um, which document? In that document that... The, the, report, le- the lesson, joint report and the investigations from the joint investigations okay. that was published in, uh, in around autumn 2019. Okay, okay. Um, so the other thing from the, in terms of y- your list of things that remain to be resolved mm. after the declaration was the development and agreement of the partnership strategy. Mm. Um, how did that evolve? How is it viewed now? How do you think it's working in practice? So I have to say, the experience of creating it was really, really good. I, I, I loved that. There was, you know, don't get me wrong, there was some honest and occasionally difficult conversations because you had to get over some of what happened in the past. But actually, Liz Ballard, who's chair, Darren Book from Amy, Mick Crofts, Karen Ramsey from the council um, at the time, they were brilliant to work with. There was other external members too, but it was pretty much those key characters, myself and Christine, uh, and briefly Deeper Shetty too, but she wasn't around for all of it. And we created a brilliant exemplary document that's now seen across the country as an exemplar street tree strategy across the country. Um, I think we did, we did a great job. And, and the council offices involved at the time really got into it and, so, and saw this, this was a really good thing. I believe that Karen Ramsey and Mick Crofts really believed in the street tree strategy. 
sadly Mick Croft re retired uh, and sadly Karen Ramsey uh, re resigned from the council shortly afterwards because she, she'd got a different job and that, that was lost but we, we came with a really good strategy I made some observations to one a council officer who was doing a review of the um, of how, why, why it worked so well uh, someone called Lawrence Haybrook who's on a, uh, who was briefly on the partnership group and I said it was really interesting because it almost felt at the time that literally anything we said we wanted we could have and I never went that far to testing it out and making an outrageous unreasonable request to be put in the strategy because I'm a reasonable person I only put reasonable stuff in but it literally felt we could have asked for anything and we could have got anything because I think the council realised also at a higher level than Mick Karen, that there was a gun to the head. They, they realised at that point, because the Forestry Commission investigation had ruled by that point, they realised that they just had to get on and design a good strategy and work with us on, on, on a good strategy. I um, have to say, though, after the, after the contract was the, the, the Street Tree Partnership, sorry, the Street Tree Strategy was signed and the Street Tree Partnership has been put into place, it hasn't worked so well. Holding the council to account for what they signed up to holding Amy to account for what they signed up to in this contract, especially given all the key people have moved on. Mick and Karen have moved from the council. Darren Butt has moved on from Amy. Um, it's really hard to hold the council to account for what they signed up to. There's a lot of issues that remain. I'm confident in the new chair, Nathan Edwards. I think we will continue to work patiently to get the council to deliver what they promised. But there remain huge risks. I, I think, there, you know, there are real risks that, uh, that this issue could flare up again if, if they don't deliver on their strategy. Okay. Um, well, just tell me a little bit more about the remaining concerns you have about risk of re-emergence uh, problems in the future. What else needs to happen to best mitigate those risks? So there's a lot of things still to be resolved. Um, there's, of those 309 trees, there's around 30% of them that still haven't been formally taken off the felling list. They're still on the felling list. So you've got to look back at this. This was December 2018 to now October 2022, so nearly four years on. The joint investigations haven't been completed. There's 30% of those 309 trees where they still haven't been jointly investigated and they're still on the felling list and may still be felled. Now, I believe some of those trees do need to be felled. Personally, I genuinely believe that some of those 30% do need to be felled, but many of them don't. And there's a real risk, because the council still seem intent, for various reasons, to fell some of those trees that don't need to be felled. There's a real risk that other campaigners want to stand under a tree and stop that tree from being felled. I, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I can never do that because of my job. I can't break the law. But I know that there's campaigners out there still spoiling for a fight, they're still resentful about what's happened, they still don't want to see trees felled that don't need to be felled, and there's a real risk with that. There's third party damage, stuff to do with insurance claims. That process is we've flagged in the, in the Street Tree Partnership for two and a half years now, there's an issue with this, and the council haven't resolved it. And so there's trees potentially about to be felled that haven't been fully examined um, for insurance reasons, and, and part of the root cause of that is the council still haven't fulfilled the commitment in the strategy which is to use cost benefit analysis when assessing trees because they currently value street trees even now at zero. They don't believe the mumbo jumbo ac academic evidence about how to value trees and so therefore street trees are valued at zero and if you've got an accounting practice where you've got a, a cost, it could be minimal cost, it could be a £500 repair to a garden wall, so no real structural damage but it could be a literally minimal cost when in a, in a basic cost benefit analysis which they refuse to use you've got zero benefits and a small cost of 100 quid you're going to fell the tree and that is at risk of happening and as a result you know, there's a risk of campaigners getting back and trying to block trees from being felled and there's a whole load of other issues I'm not going to list them all but there's a whole load of other issues in the partnership group that have yet to be resolved Okay. that I am committed to trying to resolve right. but if they can't be resolved who knows what's going to happen Okay. okay. Um, is there anything else you'd like to tell me about 
the impact the dispute had on you personally, mm. on other campaigners, also on people involved on all sides of the dispute? I can only speak from personal experience. Other people have talked about the effects on them. Um, I know what it went on locally, and I think there was always a relative local confidence that we could defend our trees in Nether Edge because we was, you know, 80% of the people in our, on the streets of Nether Edge were in favour of saving the trees and would do all sorts of amazing things to, to prevent those trees from being felled. So there was always a relative confidence in our area. For, for me personally, um, it was one of the best and worst experiences of my life. In terms of best, I got to know my local neighbours and became friends with many of them. We formed huge bonds and we still work together on all sorts of different things, not just street trees. Um, we saved 150 trees in the local area directly, 10,500 trees across Sheffield. We changed street tree legislation nationwide, working with Michael Gove. I sort of used my civil service skills and realised how rare they were. I didn't realise what skills I had. So that was great to have that proved. But in terms of worst experience in my life, there was a lot of pressure on my shoulders. There was a lot of people relying on me, depending on me to do things. I worked, and I still work, in seven years on, 30 hours a week on street tree issues, all the way through the campaign, right the way through to today, and ongoing. If I charged my hourly rate, I worked that out at £341,000 of my time which was interesting, that's how much time I've spent on the campaign. Um, so very few people were wi are willing to do what I do, have the leadership skills, have the civil service administrative skills to do what I've done, to work with Michael Gove, to work with the Information Commission, to work with the Forestry Commission, to the right FOI request in the right way to get the right answers. It's really interesting, therefore the pressure always fell on me to do some of these things. Um, I suffered from bullying and harassment from fellow campaigners. You know, there was at least four times in the campaign where the stress because of the bullying harassment I received from fellow campaigners meant I nearly walked away. Some of those things like the Forestry Commission wouldn't have happened had I walked away. I had threats to my job from the council. They accused me of, of making false accusations, but I knew I was very confident in what I was saying, so I, was, I stayed on and stayed the course. But I know another, a lot of other people, when they received similar threats, they walked away because they, you know, they, if you haven't got confidence Sometimes, if your confidence has been shaken, I totally understand why people walk away, but I knew I had evidence to back up what I was saying, and therefore I kept on. But the council knew what my job was. They knew that if there was even a whiff of me having committed a crime, such as false allegations, then I could have been suspended under investigation. Even if that investigation had then been found to be I was right, the suspension looks bad. So that's what they were using as the opportunity. They, they threatened that sort of thing. Despite all we've been through, this is the other final worst bit, despite all we've been through, still having to fight tooth and nail, even today with the council, to get them to implement the street tree strategy they signed up to, that is an ongoing stress in my life. Uh, but I can't walk away from this because I'm committed to helping Sheffield street trees. Okay, thank you very much indeed. So we've covered all the topics I wanted to ask you about. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us before we close the hearing? Yeah, there was another interesting event, or well, two things. I, th I think you got the evidence firstly about the local government ombudsman investigation that led to the apology to Alan Robshaw's family. I think that is a key thing in the whole evidence base that you need to really scrutinise. You know, the, the efforts that Alan Robshaw went to, to be reasonable, he wasn't the person that got on the streets and stood on the trees. He used an evidence-based approach, similar to myself, to, to try and say, come on council, you know, you can do this, you can do that, be reasonable here. And they either didn't answer him, lied to him, disrespected him, and he died without knowing the outcome of his complaint. And therefore he asked me on his, you know, his final week before he died, he asked me to represent him to the media when the eventual LGA report came out. I felt really sad having to do that, and I hope I did a good job for him and his family, but you know, the council had to seriously apologise for uh, what happened there. But his was focused on just Rustings Road, and uh, there's a, another LGO investigation into the Oldham Way Older that Sally Goldsmith led. But these are just small examples, and this was going on for five and a half thousand trees that were felled. 
Um, it's just that only two of those trees have full LGO investigations. They're key pieces of evidence. Yeah, there's in fact there's three LGO yeah. pieces there's of work in fact, in total, and I'm aware of those. Yeah, and then the other one was an interesting thing that happened in uh, summer autumn 2018. So again, working with Michael Gove and his special advisors, um, we were investigating how the contract could be changed. Paul Billington invited me in. This was a point where we were leading up to the talks. He invited me in for a private conversation with him, Phil Beecroft, and Liz Book. Phil Beecroft was head of highways, I think, and Liz Book was something involved in the commercial aspects of the contract. And I was saying, can't you tweak the contract to allow bendy curbs? And I think you can. And they said, no. I said, well, prove to me why. And they're like, well, no, the Department for Transport won't let us. And I was like, I think they can. And they said, no, they can't. It's all to do with risk and, and therefore perceived transfer of risk to different the finances of the contract, all that sort of stuff. So I asked them, Michael Gove Special Advisors, to, to work with the Department for Transport to, to get to the bottom of this. What was the Department for Transport's view? So what happened, and this was the most bizarre experience of my life, the um, Department for Transport were invited to a meeting which they thought was just with DEFRA, to investigate what was going on in Sheffield. They didn't know I was going to turn up as well, but basically I turned up into the room. Very, very senior person in the Department of Transport looked really scared, like they'd been set up into a trap. And the, the DEFRA special advisor said, over to you, Paul, can you ask the questions you want to ask of the Department of Transport? So I asked the questions, which was, why can't the contract be changed? And the answer was, it can be changed. You can change it in whatever way you want, so long as you can prove that you're not going to completely, completely restructure the whole contract. You're not going to say, right, the, the contract is currently to maintain the roads for 25 years, just completely wipe off the final 10 years of the contract. That's a fundamental change. Literally, all we were doing was to apply a little bendy curb, and you know, and that wasn't a significant risk. And what I found out subsequently was basically it was the questions that the council were asking of the Department for Transport, they weren't asking the right questions. Now, whether that was intentional or accidental, I don't know. So it could have been accidental, it could be. It's like with lawyers, if you ask them the wrong question, you get the wrong answer. It could be that there was no commercial mouse, and therefore they're asking the wrong questions of the Department of Transport. Or it could be they were asking the questions they wanted to ask to get the answers they wanted to get. And that's the bit that worries me. Okay. So do you have any documentation, emails or any other mm -hmm. documents relating to um, what you just said yeah. there? I'd be very interested to see any yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll documentation you have on that, any exchanges of emails yeah. with other parties, whether it's the council yeah. or central government departments. Yeah. Um, but what was interesting was subsequent to that, the, the Department of Transport and Sheffield Council collaborated on trying to answer a freedom of information request I asked both of them separately, but they wanted to make sure they had the same answer. So I'll give you all that as well. Okay, very good. <laughs> um, thank you again. Um, very helpful, and um, you know, clearly you've done a lot of work to prepare for the discussion today, which I appreciate. Um, unless there's any final thing you want to say, I think that gets us to the end of the hearing. If, if there are subsequent mm -hmm. things I haven't asked you for, <laughs> during the course of the discussion which you've, which you've agreed to provide. If there are other things that occur to you, I would be very interested to see any other evidence mm. that you have that you think is um, relevant. But unless you've got anything else to say now, then we will thank you again and close the hearing. I just wanted to say that I don't think the Council have learned the lessons. And, and I say this from a perspective of not just do the street to crisis. Uh, in, our, in our closing statement I've written, but I won't read that in full, um, there's a lot of other examples recently where they've not followed their own governance rules. If you look at the investigation into their own chief executive for her behaviour before joining council, it was a bit of a secret investigation with no rules. They didn't, they didn't set the rules of the investigation, no terms of reference, and it took so long to investigate her. She, she earned six months of contract while sitting at home. That's interesting. There's the way they treated the It's Our City governance campaign. They refused to collaborate, they refused to get expert advice from the, lo the local government um, organisation that was expert at this sort of stuff and therefore they were forced into a referendum they never needed to have. 
uh, that eventually overturned the government's rules for the council. You look at the issues with the Sheffield Central Library, the ongoing current investigations and issues to do with the cafe that's closed in Graves Park. They haven't learned. And you hear the statements from the council officers that have already attended this inquiry, and they say that it's just a communications issue. It's not. They hate expert advice from outside. They haven't learned this issue, whether it's with street trees or with other things. If other campaigns dig in and cause as much fuss like the street tree campaign did, this type of issue will happen again. They haven't learned. Okay. Anything else you want to say? No. Nope. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. So, Charles, you can stop the recording. Thank you.